All right, well, we're going to get started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Sahil Pree from Columbia University in New York City, and I'm uh, happy to be helping to host this session on behalf of Sky and our amazing panel. Uh, we want to welcome you to the Emerging Technology Series that's sponsored by Sky, uh, and we'll be beginning uh, our webinar uh, momentarily. We can uh, probably uh, give people a minute or two just to to join and then we'll get going. All right, we're going to, in the interest of time, get rolling, and hopefully people will be joining uh, as as the program goes on. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a, a tremendous faculty today, and I'm, I'm delighted that we're going to have three segments of the program. Uh, the first group is going to be our friends from St. Francis in uh, Rosin, Long Island, New York, uh, led by Ziad Ali and Omar Kalik and Evan Schlafmitz. Uh, next, uh, we'll have uh, Drs. Glenn Fendetti and, and Sarah Reinhardt. Uh, Glenn is from uh, Charlotte and uh, Sarah from Charleston, West Virginia. And then to uh, close the program, we'll have Drs. Mike Rinaldi and Peter Monteleone. Uh, Mike is in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and Peter in Austin, Texas. Next slide, please. <laughs> These are our disclosures, all of which uh, is available online. Next slide. So the agenda for the evening's program is to talk about FFRCT and coronary CT angiography uh, as part of our workflow in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. We're going to start with a, a presentation by Dr. Kalik about informed cath lab planning and treatment with CCTA and FFRCT. Uh, and his partners, uh, Drs. Ali and Schlafmitz, will provide color commentary. And next, we'll move to Drs. Fendetti and Reinhardt to talk about cardiovascular disease risk assessment Will CCTA with FFRCT and plaque analysis change the game? And then uh, finally, we'll have uh, Dr. Rinaldi and Monteleone talk about case studies, how FFRCT as a disruptive technology affected their facilities. Next slide, please. I want to acknowledge uh, an unrestricted educational grant from HeartFlow uh, to sponsor tonight's program. Next slide, please. I wanted to remind everybody that SCA and I has accredited this program through ACCME for one uh, hour of AMA PRA category one credit. And the ABIM has also granted one hour of MOC credit for this program. Next slide. Evaluations for the course uh, and appropriate uh, documentation for your MOC and CME credits are available in the Sky Online Learning Center under My Courses. Sky will also email a link after the webinar uh, to the attendees. So with that, I'm going to turn the, the podium over to uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kalik, and he's going to get us started. Omar, welcome. All right. Thank you. Let's um, get started with the presentation here. So <clears throat> we're going to do a general talk on um, 
cath lab planning and treatment, more of an intro to heart flow. So the heart flow analysis um, is an artificial intelligence tool uh, which simulates invasive FFR from our regular CT. It exists into the exi in, it fits into the existing patient workflow. So we can do our regular CT. Uh, we don't need to do any specific um, additional protocols. There's uh, really no added radiation or added medications, and the proprietary software. Um, will generate this 3D model uh, where we can place various pins to uh, <clears throat> determine what the FFRCT will be at various locations. <clears throat> what they've developed now is actually a complete solution. So starting with anatomy um, and then physiology is the component we'll be mostly discussing and plaque as well, which will be discussed in one of the other talks. So historically, the uh, CAD workflow has been a bit scattered from the chest pain patient who comes into the ER and um, could get a slew of tests, including a stress EKG, it could be a nuclear, um, and could be a CT. And typically, this, uh, th these various tests can generate high false positive and false negative rates, um, which really makes things uh, more confusing rather than clarifies things. With CT, we can get a really streamlined workflow and with the addition of heart flow, um, we can get more clarity on not only the uh, stenosis, um, but also the physiology as well. And this can really streamline things in the workflow. <clears throat> the 2021 uh, chest pain guidelines, um, not only was CT elevated to a class 1A uh, recommendation, for stable chest pain imaging. Uh, FFRCT as well was uh, placed into the guidelines for the first time as a 2A recommendation. Some examples of cases where it, it's really helpful. Here's a case um, where we uh, avoided a false positive. So this is a female with a silent MI um, with a positive spect um, with the CT here, um, which uh, is, is not very clear. And on the invasive angiogram, um, what was found was no significant stenosis as well as uh, an FFR um, of 0.86, so not significant. In retrospect, the uh, FFR CT in this case um, was well above 0.8, so not significant and matching the invasive findings. So had it been available for this case, potentially an uh, invasive test could have been avoided. Here's a converse example of identifying overlooked disease. So a 70 year old male um, with chest pain with a normal stress echo um, and uh, a high pretest probability for CAD. So this is something which would have been overlooked on the stress echo, uh, which has a fairly poor predictive value. And uh, instead, a CCTA and FFRCT was done to uh, clarify. And in this case, we see significant disease uh, by FFRCT in the left system confirmed um, by invasive findings and, and then treated. We know from um, a few trials, various aspects where FFRCT really shines. So this is the Pacific study, which compared various modalities uh, where we learned that uh, FFRCT is additive to uh, coronary CT uh, with a very high area under the curve compared to invasive FFR. In the advanced DK trial, what was found was very interesting is that um, <clears throat> abnormal plaques and abnormal FFRCT really predicted events at different time points. So in fact, by getting um, these two different pieces of information from the CT, uh, we can potentially predict different timelines of cardiac events. And additionally, what was found is that an uh, FFRCT guided revascularization strategy actually improved outcomes at three years. This was the precise trial, which uh, was <clears throat> was uh, where the design was 
really to study uh, cath lab efficiency. So we see here in this schematic that um, with uh, every 100 patients, approximately double the number of patients were appropriately referred uh, for treatable uh, coronary disease uh, as opposed to the traditional testing pathway. And this is just another um, chart of the same thing showing an increased efficiency. So really sending appropriate patients into the cath lab um, rather than uh, negative invasive angiograms. <clears throat> this is a chart from uh, Sanger Heart Institute of which we have a few members on this call. So maybe you can speak to it more. Uh, but the net revenue per cath for them was shown to be um, up by 25% over a two year period with the increase in use of FFRCT, presumably because of the uh, performance of uh, appropriate treatments for CAD. Fish and chips was a recent study um, from the NHS, which basically showed uh, compared um, CTs done before the NICE guidelines where uh, FFRCT really uh, entered the system compared to afterwards. And this was quite an extensive study going through uh, 4.7 million health records of the NHS. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in summary, what it showed that at two years, the heart flow program at a national level um, resulted in less all cause uh, and cardiovascular mortality, um, reduced testing, increased revascularization, higher use of medications, increased cath lab efficiency uh, without any differences in the rates of MI. And finally, um, CT and also FFRCT and the various tools provided by HeartFlow can be very useful for pre-procedural cath lab planning. And this is the uh, next era we're entering, whereas similarly to structural heart disease, um, we're gonna be using the CT for uh, the planning in the cath lab. This is a case of a 67 year old male with typical angina uh, with chest pressure where uh, a coronary CTA was ordered. Here's an example of the roadmap analysis, which I mentioned before. And what this does is it quickly shows us um, that in the LAD in this case, there are two um, sequential moderate stenoses. And the, <clears throat> And the FFRCT on the right-hand panel shows a significant value of 0.69, uh, which is uh, just distal to those two lesions. Here's uh, the plaque analysis, which will be talked about more later, but it, it uh, shows us an outlay of where the calcified plaques are um, and also quantifies the total plaque burden. And another thing it shows us on the right is uh, where you have the blue lines is potential landing zones for your stents um, and where the diagonal origin is. Here are just uh, the invasive angiograms um, showing an image that matches what we saw on the CT. Um, and <clears throat> after integrating all of this information, the invasive strategy was employed based on the, the various pieces of information provided from uh, not only the CT, but the, uh, the plaque, and the anatomy, and the FFR CT. And uh, I think in the next stage, we'll lead to more exciting things. This is something that's being studied currently, which is a PCI planner, um, where you can virtually implant a stent um, or various stents, and it will uh, predict what would your change in FFRCT be and what would the, the final value be after placing stents to treat the vessels. Thank you. We're going to invite uh, Drs. Ali and Schlafmitz to sort of offer their perspective, along with Dr. Kalik, about how FFRCT has been integrated into their very busy cath lab at, at St. Francis. <clears throat> so a few things that uh, I think are worth mentioning in terms of workflow for us. So uh, one of the things is, you know, where these source, uh, the source of the CT is coming. Is it coming for an outside position or is it coming internally? So at St. Francis, we made a concerted effort to actually integrate the FFRCT work order into the CTA or work order because having two separate orders is burdensome. What we actually did is we, um, because we understand the value of physiology, we actually 
included an opt-out strategy. So patients have an automatic FFRCT unless there's a reason that the physician feels like they wouldn't want it in this case. And so what that's done is it's integrated all of our patients into a physiology-friendly environment so that when the patients and the physicians receive their reports back, they not only get the CT, but they have the FFR. So they can use it for physiology guidance very early. Yep, and I think just to add to that, you know, part of what Omar mentioned with um, the class one indication, it's for guiding decision-making. And, and that's beyond now in contemporary programs, just do they go to the cath lab, yes or no? It's what do we do in the cath lab? And it can help you to determine are you doing this in a center with surgical backup? Are you going radial versus femoral for access? Do you need, you know, seven French guide or, you know, for guide selection and what equipment you need in the room? You can get all that information um, between the CT, the uh, PCI planner. So it really helps for your actual procedural planning. And exactly as Omar <clears throat> said, the same thing that we do for structural heart, we're just modernizing and standardizing an approach to um, PCI as opposed to just ad hoc making these decision-making decisions when you have all this information ahead of time. And then I find it particularly useful for the cases where we don't go to the cath lab, it's much better than just this is a normal result. When you talk to a patient and go through the results with them, it's extremely effective at getting patients to be compliant with pharmacotherapy. You know, one other thing that I, I would say is that um, in terms of everybody who's out there who's interested in integrating this into their cath lab is <clears throat> there is a, a certain inertia to get CT into the cath lab because traditionally it's been an imaging only <clears throat> um, sort of modality. And it took some effort to get the, you know, Terra Recon placed into the, into the cath lab so that people could actually get onto it and review it. But that's one of the nice things about HeartFlow and the planners. It's available uh, to people pretty much anywhere. So you can integrate this into your cath lab really quickly. And because it's interactive, you can sort of decide your stenting strategy based on it at a very, very early um, uh, an early point. And uh, Z, what do you say to the... Uh traditionalists that like to use other modalities for assessment. We saw the area under the curve of the ROC curves that Omar presented, but how do you address that from both your referring population and also uh, internally? <clears throat> well, I, I think there's a couple of, of important uh, topics to discuss, right, science, And one is, uh, is reimbursement and payment, right? So, you know, St. Francis does a largely employed population, Catholic Health Services employs most of its doctors. And so there's not really the private practice incentive to do a nuke when we can get anatomy and physiology. Uh, and so for our practice in particular, that isn't much of a problem. But, you know, Evan, for example, does get a lot of patients from private practitioners who still, they have a nuclear system in their office, they need to pay the bills, they're still going to do nuke. So that problem, you know, exists, but I would say it's getting better. The second thing is, you know, a lot of people aren't trained in CT, but they're trained in nuke. So you have some of, you know, the older practices, some of the physicians who are, are more nuclear centric, they don't really know how to read the CT. And then the software is not available to them and is very expensive. So that kind of makes them stick towards being on CT. That's one of the things that HeartFlow does really well is it makes it much easier for the physician who's you know traditionally doing nuclears or exercise treadmill tests to be able to interpret this data in a way that's actionable. You have a CT with a positive FFR, you need to be referred for calf. If you have a CT with a 50% lesion, you're not really sure what to do with that patient necessarily. You get a CADRAS number. I mean, did you know what a CADRAS number was before you started actually investigating CT? No, you have no idea, right? What is a CADRAS? CADRAS 3, what is that, right? It wasn't designed for, for practicing cardiology. It was really made for the imagers. And that's what I like about integrating the technology because most people understand FFR and most people understand the value of the cutoff. All right, and uh, Omar, I got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, for you. How is FFRCT data derived? Density of contrast for computational physics? 
And then there's another quick one right after that for you. Yeah, so uh, no, I don't think we have engineers on this call, but it's uh, it's computational flow dynamics and it's a pr pr proprietary algorithm uh, derived from heart flow, uh, which yeah, it's, uh, we it's don't a lot have of the differential we, equations. We, we don't yeah. have the exact details, but they certainly have IP on that. So, uh, uh, and and what about uh, the next question was. How, is the data generated locally and how long is the turnaround? I think you mentioned it in your talk, maybe. So it's not generated locally. It's it's a send out. But the way we do it and, and many centers and, and Sa I know Sanger does the same thing. Um, and Ziad mentioned that is that we have what's called the direct workflow. So all of our cases um, go into heart flow. They're all analyzed. Um, and then uh, when the heart flow is ordered, we're able to release those cases and, and they're, they're, they're already present. So the listed turnaround on the slides is less than four hours. Um, expedited can sometimes be less than that. And, and yeah, quick, we've been getting them back in, in up to an, in like an hour and a half when we need them expedited, like ER patients, et cetera. Uh, there, uh, I'm, I'm hearing there's a raised hand somewhere. Let me, uh, let me see. But if, if not, let me, I'm just going to get two quick hitters. What about calcium? And uh, how does it correlate with invasive angio? And then we'll move to the next talk. So, um, so calcium um, is actually, at least in our group, one of the reasons we send to heart flow um, because, because of the AI and the proprietary uh, algorithm, which they have, um, they're sometimes able to read through the calcium and get more accurate results. So uh, some of the indeterminate areas from calcium are, are ones that we tend to send. Uh, and then the invasive angiogram, um, you know, you're, uh, I mean, FFRCT is physiology and invasive angiogram would be anatomy. We saw that the uh, invasive FFR compares well. Um, I would say CT in general shows something different and potentially shows things that invasive angiograms miss, including positive remodeling, calcium outside the vessels, uh, and things like that. Spoken like a true I imager. So I have a question for Omar. So given that, you know, CT is better prediction than nuclear and uh, nuclear stress and uh, stress echo. How long do you think pay before payers start to insist on this as a first line therapy and how much time do, do people have to get with the program? So I, I think we're slowly getting there. As you correctly pointed out, the two most used modalities still in the country for ischemia testing are the two worst and that's stress echo and nuclear spect. Um, and some of the issues Ziad mentioned, it's uh, a lot of historical <clears throat> issues and, uh, and reimbursement. But I think we're, we're slowly getting there. Nuclear still has a, a, a pretty strong lobby, so there's some political issues tied in. Um, but I think as we go along, um, CT is really gaining steam after the 2021 guidelines. And I think it's not going to be too long. I would say within the next five years, there's probably going to be a big push for CT to replace nuclear as all the old nuclear cameras uh, go to end of life. I think there's going to be a transition. Well, with that, Omar, let's transition the, uh, to the next talk, which I think will provide even more fuel to that argument. And I'd invite Dr. Svendetti and Reinhardt to, to start with their presentation. Thanks, guys, for being here. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for uh, the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a tough act to follow. For, for this, uh, this segment, Dr. Reinhardt and I, we're gonna present a case and we're gonna talk about um, not just the aspects of interventional cardiology for the, the SCAI group, but you know we also manage these patients' uh, overall cardiovascular risk. So the goals are to talk about, you know, we're, oh, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, yeah, just risk in general, where we stand, how the CT pathway plays a role in that, not just the FFR CT analysis, but also the introduction of plaque, uh, which will soon be rolled out um, to all, you know, all, all providers using the platform. And then finally, um, where do we stand with subclinical atherosclerosis and, and what's, what's the significance of this? So next slide, please. So really, we just have one case to present. And, uh, you know, for all of us that see patients either in the office or in the pre-cath holding area, I like to, you know, keep it keep it light and use examples of patients that we often see and have difficulty managing. This is a particularly, um, you know, good case, uh, I think, for this this topic, the topic of plaque analysis, because it, it occurred before there was a change in the guidelines. 
So this gentleman, 45-year-old, presented in 2021, um, nonspecific anginal symptoms, mainly dyspnea, reflux symptoms, um, strong family history. You see the other risk factors. Uh, you know, notes some alcohol as he holds a beer in his uh, in his photo. And then, you know, really couldn't pin down his tobacco use. Um, finally, uh, a provider in the past had had uh, attempted to, uh, you know, start a statin on him at least because of an elevated LDL and family history. He didn't like it, stopped it, and uh, and finally, just on examination, pretty unremarkable aside from having um, some elevated blood pressure. So, next slide, please. So, the first step uh, I think is to you know, in a stepwise fashion, I, it, it's it's not often that you know I had logged onto this a website before. Uh, you know, uh, this module, but I think it's something which all providers, primary care physicians, cardiologists should, you know, should be aware of. This uh, this risk assessment tool, it really looks at six clinical uh, factors and it's population-based. It's a population cohort analysis, and this is our starting point. Uh, we shouldn't just evaluate patients by gestalt. So if you plug in, um, in, in Barney's data here, he's a, you know, middle-aged male, um, blood hypertensive, as you can see, the cholesterol, it looks at the total HDL and then some other key risk factors, not diabetic, he states that he's a smoker, but, you know, not currently. And, and finally, um, not on medication. So uh, please advance. His overall risk by this calculation would say that he's 4.4%, low risk. He's statin hesitant. So he's, he's not interested really in medical therapy at this time. But with his dyspnea, what's our next step? He's a reasonable patient, you know, with the new guidelines. Uh, you know, again, this is the end of two, 2021 to proceed with dyspnea in this individual for uh, dyspnea is an anginal equivalent. So we go with the CT, uh, coronary CTA. And here's the study. So really, it, it's it's not that impressive. It shows a non-obstructive plaque, proximal LAD, and this is an actual patient at his first diagonal branch, as pointed out. And, you know, with the guidelines, the the uh, the criteria of indeterminate lesions are defined as 40 to, um, you know, 90% stenosis. So he meets criteria for a um, FFR CT analysis, and that's he, what he was sent for. And this is this is the uh, the result here. You can see it on the uh, the right side of the the uh, right side of the screen. But basically, he has um, you know there's no focal stenosis. The distal uh, tapering edges of the diagonal and LED branch is 0 0.76, but it was interpreted as a normal FFR CT ana analysis in non obstructive disease. And again, before the guideline, uh, the the final interpretation was given this patient's findings, uh, medical management, risk factor modification, nothing specific. Consider statin. Um, he was hypertensive, so they, they called him for a prescription for uh, for Norvask, and, and 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 also based on the 2019 prevention guidelines, the patient was taken off aspirin. All right, so uh, we see where this uh, where this train is headed. Next uh, slide, please. About one month later, he actually presented with an ST elevation MI, as you can see from the left ventricular gram. Uh, he had, you know, this is a legitimate case. He had uh, clear LV dysfunction. Um, and uh, it, was, it was brought to the cath lab. You know, in, in history upon arrival, he, he said he really hadn't taken his meds. Uh, he hadn't, it, it, 2021, there were access issues, wasn't able to get into the office, thought everything was okay, and so uh, thought he had a normal scan. So next slide, please. And as you can see from the findings in the, uh, the upper corner of the screen, the LED is missing. That's pre-intervention, post-intervention. Uh, you know, for a group of interventionalists, I think we, you know, deal with these types of cases on a routine basis. But ultimately, there was a delay in presentation for a patient that didn't want to take medicines. Uh, next, uh, can advance. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, uh, even months later, his LV recovery is unclear. He's got myocardial scar, enormous hospital bill. And not only is he on medicines, but uh, to this day, he's on medications such as Entresto, um, SGL2 inhibitor, et cetera. So he is, uh, he, he is now a, a committed patient. Okay, next slide, please. So, you know, what went wrong? You know, past analysis says that if you get a coronary CT scan, it should be long-term confidence. Uh, in fact, at the, uh, the 10-year uh, uh, analysis, which suggests that, you know, 99% survival rate, and even if in this individual's case, he had a, CAD, a CAD RAD score of one to two, which is mild plaque, let's say, he should have had a, you know, warranty of at least eight to nine years, 99% without adverse events. Advance. But what we now know, and I think this is one of the key features that I, you know, picked up on later in the guidelines, is they also mentioned it's the first time they addressed non-obstructive uh, subclinical atherosclerosis. And for patients with this, there's really no guideline for for plaque. Okay, it's it's not just fifty percent or not. That's the what's considered significant. Two thousand twenty-one, they said treat these patients as you would uh, to optimize the preventive therapies. So next slide, please. 
So in addition, this is just uh, you know the flow chart um, that's uh, available in that twenty in a twenty nineteen preventative guideline. We have this individual. He's middle aged. Uh, he you know between forty and seventy, high cholesterol. So advance, please. Next step is you know by his history, he attributed to not smoking, right? And it and it's just one of these six features. This is sort of how flawed this current uh, ASC uh, CVD analysis is. If he said he was a smoker, he would jump into the intermediate risk because he's a non-smoker, he's lower risk. And another feature, next slide, is, is, is something that really is not discussed enough. I mean, I, I think if you're a preventive car cardiologist, they, they commonly order these tests, but we, you know, we should ask and test for, according to the guidelines, specific conditions, not just, um, you know, not just the six risk factors in the, in the analysis, but also CRP levels, APOB, ABI, and it's just not done. And that can falsely lower someone's risk. So clear that it's missed and we're under treating these patients. Uh, so next slide, please. So the takeaway from this is that, yes, the CT can be performed, but, you know, unless the, uh, the health benefits are only uh, just like many of us, that during the pandemic invested heavily in expensive equipment, if we're not utilizing it correctly, and in this case, a CT scan, if we're not us utilizing it co co uh, correctly to educate our patients and to show them firsthand, then um, then it you know can can result in you know just a, a lack of utility. So advance, please. So in his case, lifestyle changes, smoking cessation, medications are encouraged. Advance, please. Um, to just, uh, to just, I think a, a key take home point that we've gone through this before, there are many, many ways of accessing the data. You can access it on your phone, on a laptop, in the cath lab, in the office, et cetera. It is so important. It's important that when you have the information, make sure someone is communicating that with the patient and it's intuitive. They have the FFR CT analysis is like a Google map. They understand if it's, you know, blue, it's good traffic flow, red, bad traffic flow. And also I think with the addition on the far left side of the screen with the plaque analysis, it's just an added feature for patients that if they're looking at these studies with you, there's really a lot more buy-in. And I think this, this added feature is a one-stop shop. Next slide, please. So quickly, the uh, precision pathway, you know, leads to uh, when you, this is a, a landmark study done with the, really looking at the 2021 guidelines, steering patients toward a CT first pathway which should in the future change the guidelines as, you know, as we've mentioned, why aren't more people buying in to this? Um, there's, there's just higher compliance with statin use, antiplatelet use, et cetera. Next slide, please. So what's the next, uh, the next layer? Well, so now it's, this is 2021. Where do, where do we stand 2024? We now have plaque uh, analysis. Well, would knowledge of the patient's volume and possibly composition of the plaque would have changed this outcome? You know, are we there yet? Are we able to identify thin fibrous cap, the vulnerable plaque, and other features. Um, next slide, please. Um, obviously, in the future, we hope that CT doesn't just tell us um, just limited uh, assessment of plaque where we currently stand. Uh, I do think that there's high risk features that we hope will be incorporated and utilized as the spatial resolution increases over time. Specifically, uh, you know, right now we can currently assess patients' low attenuation plaque, but the goal would be to hopefully have you know positive remodeling that's being studied in in future trials and other features because the goal especially in this individual's case was to look for acute coronary syndrome not just to identify plaque but which plaques are most likely to rupture so next slide please so finally um, if we uh, we had access at our institution for about three months to plaque analysis they were kind enough even though it was 2021 to to run his data. And, and this is this is uh, Barney's actual um, plaque plaque review, and you can see. Uh, please advance here. Um, so, what are my eyes drawn to? If this is the first time you're looking at it, the uh, plaque uh, model with composition and volume it tells you you know whether or not they have calcified or non-calcified plaque, and specifically low attenuation plaque. And Dr. Reinhardt will get into this in more detail. And you can see if it's more than four percent is considered the, the the current cutoff. Anything low attenuation plaque greater than four uh, percent it can be associated with a high risk event. So the LAD, you can see it had a high-risk LAD, advanced, please. Also the RCA, um, if you advance uh, right there, you see the green territory. There's, a, there's some plaque in there. And finally, the patient's total black plaque volume. And I think this is key uh, because this is where uh, the, uh, the future of the plaque analysis is. It's difficult to predict which lesions will rupture. In fact, don't, you know 75% do stabilize over time. But this normogram helps risk stratify patients, which Dr. Reinhardt will talk about in more detail. And in this individual's case, he would, even though he's 45, a plaque uh, volume of uh, you know 125 or, or so millimeters squared 
it puts it cube that puts them in the 75th percentile, which is quite high and would warrant a higher level of therapy, which uh, we'll get into in just a bit. Next slide, please. So this is Dr. Reinhardt's portion. Thank you again for the invitation to join and thank you, Dr. Fandetti, for that excellent intro into this case. So one of the things the new uh, chest pain guidelines did is they transformed our traditional CAD definition, which was typically anything moderate or severely stenosed. Um, next. And, and it changed our diagnosis for the CAD threshold to include anything non-obstructive, which changes how we treat people. So again, I can remember patients coming out of the lab saying, oh, nothing needed to be done. Uh, I There was just uh, minimal irregularities. Well, that is still CAD. We just have to change how we're discussing things with our patients because there are so many advantages on the medical side of things. So as we keep going with that new CAD definition, we have to transform how we're describing what we are seeing to our patients. Next slide. So if I like to highlight this because this is actually the gold registry, and this looks at people with clinical, uh, clinical coronary artery disease, strokes, uh, peripheral vascular disease. These are people we have revascularized. These are the patients that the interventionalists deal with all the time. And this is looking at what we are doing in the real world. Uh, it's a real world registry. And based upon this questionnaire, 73% of patients actually believed in lowering the LDL cholesterol to less than 70. But belief does not necessarily translate to observed clinical care. So what they found here is two thirds of the highest risk patients that we are dealing with remain with an LDL that is uncontrolled. And in 2022, by the way, it shifted to less than 55. And there are so many people in our communities who aren't even aware that the new target for these very high risk patients is now less than 55. And if you look at this, 100% are not reaching their target. So it just goes to say we need to do a better job and what tools can we have that will help us? So Santorini looked at the European guidelines. And again, what they found is a couple problems. Number one, we were initially risk classifying people uh, to 29% high risk, 70% as very high risk. Um, and what they did in the central reassessment of that risk classification, they actually found that we were underestimating that very high risk category by at least 20%. So as we look into the conclusion of the Santorini things, they felt that the goals were not being sufficiently implemented and factors that could be contributing to this may be inadequate risk classification, Maybe we're not identifying the new targets appropriately for those risk categories, but also underutilization of the combination therapies. And when I teach people who don't deal with lipids every day, PCSK9s are very easy to get approved, especially when you have a CT available. A calcium score of 300 in my state, I can get approval for a PCSK9 inhibitor. If you have almost any disease, especially if you document atherosclerosis, it's again evidence that um, you can add on PCSK9 if their LDLs are not at target. So as we move forward, we want, need a plaque information that maybe can help us reach those targets for our patients. So one of the things that they did is with the reveal plaque, they looked at, is this plaque analysis that we're doing accurate? And what we did is a large comparison to IVIS and a global perspective study. And there was 95% agreement with IVIS to, in determining the plaque volume. And it was also very good in quantifying both the calcified and non-calcified calcified plaque as well. So we know for a fact that um, the total plaque volumes are associated with a significant increase in our ha hazard ratio, but I think it's important to 
talk to our audiences and our physicians that a plaque threshold of over 240 is really what is associated with significantly increased risk of events. So our event rate increases as the total coronary plaque volume grows. We all know this, we experience it, but if it's mild luminal stenosis or minimal luminal stenosis, probably we are underestimating how much plaque that patient actually has. So with the plaque nomograms, we can actually create these age and sex specific uh, percentiles that make it more instead uh, centric to the patient themselves and how we can adjust their therapy. So, Dr. Fandetti did a good job of explaining this low attenuation plaque burden. If you have this, it it's, correlates with lipid-rich necrotic core on IVIS or as well as um, uh, fibro fatty in some thresh thresholds if you compared it to IVIS with virtual histology. But again, when you look at the plaque burden of more than 4%, there's a 4.6 hazard ratio. So patients with that more than 4% threshold have a five-time increased risk of fatal or non-fatal heart attacks. As we go forward, what can we do? What I say to people is the FFRCT that Dr. Kalik uh, eloquently um, discussed tells us, do we need to take the person to the lab today? Uh, is there something we need to intervene on? But what we see with a plaque is it goes beyond the biomarkers and traditional risk factors to tell us what is going to happen over the next five, 10 years with a progression of that plaque. So beyond the biomarkers and the traditional uh, risk factors, the plaque volumes are most predictive of how those plaques are going to progress with time. So as we go forward, uh, this is actually quite interesting as part of the uh, Emerald study. And I think this is where we're going, is that when we see a change or a delta of the FFRCT, especially if it's more than 0.12, and as well as high risk plaque, those were the highest predictors of, of future events. And as we go through some of these patients, it is important that we kind of can risk stratify these as we go. So we know we have this accurate algorithm, but how do we use these in, in a forum to change our medical therapy? Is it doable? Is it not? So we had three physicians look at CTA reports, not the images initially, and we staged their medical therapy. And as you can see, a lot of them started out on stage two therapy because they had disease. We wanted to start on aspirin and high intensity statin. So if you look at what we reclassified patients, we maintain therapy in about a third of those patients, but two thirds of the patients were actually reclassified when we looked at the plaque analysis tool. And sometimes it's because we saw those basic things, but we were able to see more plaque. We were able to see how much non-calcified plaque there was better than our visual eyes could see which is so super important in how we are treating these patients. As we go forward and we look at the advanced DK that you've seen once before already, if you look at the first slide here, you're looking at, um, go ahead. You're looking at the FRCT negative and plaque analysis, which was negative. And what you see is there's really no risk of spontaneous MI. As we go forward and you still have, uh, to the next slide, you see FFRCT is negative, but the plaque analysis is positive. And you see an uptick in the rates of MI. And these are from plaque related events. But as we go forward to where FFRCT becomes positive, but the plaque analysis is negative, you're still seeing an uptick in advance of the events. But these are more driven by FFRCT positive lesions. But if you look at the combination on this next slide, you're going to see that the FFRCT plus the, plus the plaque high-risk features have 35-fold higher risk of MIs. So taking all of the pieces of information together is really important in how we met, manage these patients going forward. So what we have come up with is an algorithm to make it easy. So one of my frustrations with CADRADS is whenever I came 
from Atlanta to West Virginia, and I'm dealing with the highest risk people. Again, what are the goals for these patients? What does aggressive medical therapy really mean? So for each stage of plaque burden, we call mild, moderate, severe, and extensive. There's a total plaque volume. So again, our patient had plaque volume of over 100. So we're saying the goal should be at least less than 70. Uh, and we recommend some therapies according to that. But if your percentile is high or you have risk enhancers, which this patient did, remember he was at the 75th percentile. He also had high triglycerides and, and family history. So again, you're going to shift him to a more aggressive therapy, probably of less than 55, because he had those risk enhancers in percentile that was high. So it makes it much more objective. As we look forward to this next thing, this shows our patient, right? So he had the 75th percentile in the nomogram. And what I want to highlight here is, yes, it was only a moderate plaque burden, but you look, there was a high burden of that low attenuation plaque, but so much of that plaque, over 97% was non-calcified, which is another risk factor proximal location. So all of these things, the amount of non-calcified plaque, the risk enhancers, as well as that nomogram, we would probably shift our therapy to close to less than 55 in this patient because of all these high risk features. So as we go through our patient, he's probably one of the, uh, went from almost mild minimal disease being told that you have nothing to worry about, the FFRCT is negative, to actually shifting to a high, being a higher risk patient that needs to be aggressively medically managed. But it's a matter of coupling. And if the interventionalists are ordering these CTs, I have a lot of interventionalists ordering CTs, but they couple with me because they don't want to deal with the lipid management. So finding someone you can partner with to really give the complete care, looking at the plaque analysis plus the potential uh, FFRCT issues, because this is going to transform care. It's going to take a lot of time. And I will tell you that uh, we actually just launched um, a trial today, um, which is our plaque registry called Decide Plaque, to really look at how this product is going to impact our medical decision making in the future. So if we go forward, one more thing, just the summary is that this patient is going to be transformed with this medical management. Dr. Fandetti, closing remarks. Well, in the interest of time, yeah, I think if we advance, he, uh, we should have, uh, well, the biggest thing to take away from that, in addition to the statin treatment, is someone brought up the concept of the calcium score. His calcium score was, what, four, uh, mainly in the RCA distribution. So it was well under 100. Yes, he would have been on a statin. But I think stopping the aspirin as well, uh, that advanced DK registry, which we showed, uh, we need to learn more from that. It was only 800 patients in a very specific subset, the population in the, the advanced trial uh, over the course of three years in, in, in Denmark. Um, we need to learn from that. you know. And, and if someone is FFRCT positive, what I need to learn is, does that mean at any segment? So for example, my patient also had a, a distal, very apical FFRCT of 0.73. So that plus the, um, the the high plaque score for his age uh, would have put him in the highest category on that last slide. So he would have gone from someone downshifting therapy to really us sitting down, learning more about his personalized uh, uh, risk assessment saying, we need to have, you know, you, we need to make some changes, especially lifestyle changes. But in the interest of time, uh, I think we probably need to move on to the next talk. Thank you guys. That was a great discussion. We're going to, as usual, let our uh, cleanup hitters, uh, try to catch up a little bit. Uh, and so I think Mike going to let you uh, take the stage here. All right, let's, uh, let's do this. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. In the beginning. Here, can you see that? I don't see your slides. Uh, let's see if our uh, tech team can Help us. Let's see if I can get it. Is that working now? Can you see it now? I'm afraid not, Mike. Okay. Working on it. Oh, there we go. All right. Good. 
now it's happening. What happens to get 55 year olds to try to use technology? Good God. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to do a, a case presentation and we've looked a little bit about pr uh, prevention and this is a little about the other side of prevention. So, um, here are my disclosures. So here's a 67 year old admitted with progressive anginal symptoms, uh, kind of chronic stable, but getting worse progressively responsive to nitroglycerin, um, negative troponins, past medical history, extensive vascular disease, a previous ilio iliofemoral and, uh, uh, and left fem to right uh, bypass surgery, type two diabetes mellitus with nephropathy, chronic kidney disease three, COPD, reform smoking, had a previous negative nuclear study in 2018. Echocardiogram at this admission shows preserved LV function, no valvular disease. So, so the question is, how would you approach this patient? Would you, you know, they have negative troponins, they've got sort of progressive class three symptoms. Um, would you start with a stress test? Would you go straight to catheterization, no femoral access, which you can probably use radial access? And, and what I'll tell you is we decided to get a, a, a CT scan. And so what the CT scan shows is a left dominant system with a possible left main and multivessel disease. And it shows extensive plaque, both soft and calcified plaque, and potentially sort of high risk uh, features. Now, when we uh, add the, C, the, the FFR to the CT, you can see this is a pretty high risk anatomy that suggests that that left main disease is real and that they really have uh, a left dominant system with, with left main disease. And it's quite possible that a nuclear stress test would have missed this because of balanced ischemia. Uh, gonna be hard to put this patient on a treadmill with his vascular disease. And so how would you manage this patient? So, you know, calf can miss osteal disease. I, I've actually had episodes, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, in our system where, where, uh, where an osteal disease was missed because the catheter slipped past the osteal disease and the CAT scan actually picked it up. And so that, that does happen. And CTFVAR, you can manipulate the lesion. Um, you can show different angles to pick the layout bifurcation lesions. You could see the extent of calcium because the amount of calcium in a lesion matters when you're doing a PCI, whether you're gonna pull out rotational atherectomy, whether you're gonna use shockwave. Um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, what's the length of disease? Does it involve bifurcations? Or is the ostium in the bifurcation? So you get a lot of really useful information before you go into the case. Um, and additionally, in this case, we picked up other things. So this patient on CT has a has a has a um, has a, a, a porcelain aorta, and that that's problematic for bypass surgery. So you know all this information before you even go to the cath lab. So you can have a much more detailed conversation with the patient, uh, involve CT surgery early and plan out either a complex PCI or have a discussion with your, with your, uh, with your team. So the patient was taking the cath lab for, ra for radial access. You could see, you know, there's disease at the left main. I, I mean, it doesn't look horrible. Uh, and, you know, maybe somebody might have overlooked this, especially given that it's kind of eccentric and in the, uh, in the caudal view, in the spider view, it doesn't even look that terrible. Mike, we can't see your angios. Can you click uh, on them to play them there? Oh, you can't see them. That's just click on them to play. It, we, yeah, we're we're not it in presenter mode here, but we, we didn't want to stop your train of thought. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Can you see That's it now? Uh, well, unfortunately, they're not playing for us. Can huh. you put us in presenter mode? Is there a way to switch us over? Uh, let's see. I, I'll, I'm going to just come out of. Uh, there you see. go. All yeah, right. That's better. Click on click on that and see. If go it'll back play. one more. Can you see that now? I'm afraid they're not playing, okay, but uh, we saw the CT and that's all that matters, right, Mike? All right. Well, um, there you yeah. go. All right. So at any rate, there's, there is a porcelain aorta. So um, what we decided to do was, um, it was, well, I'll tell you in a minute. So, um, so what are the benefits of coronary CTA in this kind of a, a patient? So um, as we've already heard, there's more comprehensive cardiac assessment for non, you can look at the character of the plaque, the stenosis, the hemodynamic significance, uh, you have better outcomes, sort of higher impact factor in terms of uh, medically managing, bringing the right patient to the cath lab, keeping patients who don't belong in the cath lab out of the cath lab. And it's supported by, you know, very high um, outcome, uh, high level outcomes data. And the patients like it uh, um, because there's less, you know, um, it's an easier thing than laying there in front of a nuclear camera. CT scans pretty quick. I've had one myself. 
Uh, they're pretty straightforward, uh, less radiation and brief scan times. We've already seen this data. It's, it has you know, the best AUC compared to other modalities. Uh, and, it, and it really does enable better cath lab efficiency. So, you know, in my cath lab, which, which is, a, you know, getting time in the cath lab is premier. What you don't want to do is spend the day doing a bunch of negative caths. You want patients who belong in the lab where you can either center to bypass surgery or do PCI or actually utilize what you're there for. You know, the time of just doing a bunch of negative diagnostic caths hopefully is coming to an end. So, you know, in my system, we're doing now over 10,000 coronary CTAs a year. And, uh, and that has definitely changed things. What it has not changed is the number of patients coming to the cath lab. What it did change is the number of nuclear and stress echoes uh, have gone down. And that's a good thing because those are not as useful tests as coronary CTA. Uh, there are certainly some patients where, where, where other modalities can be helpful. If you've had previous extensive stenting or if you've known to have extensive coronary disease, We've had a previous, previous bypass surgery, a functional assessment alone may be appropriate, although we've turned more and more to cardiac MRI. But, but, uh, but coronary CTA has really our, become our first line modality for the majority of patients, over 10,000 studies. And we've shown that coronary CTA compared to other modalities in our own hands results in patients going to the cath lab with a much lower chance of getting a negative cath. That if they come to the lab, they have disease and they're gonna get some type of revascularization. So, uh, so what did we do? We felt that this patient was um, uh, uh, too high for, for uh, too high risk for bypass surgery, primarily because of the porcelain aorta. We thought that um, PCI uh, could be conducted. Now, you could do an unprotected left main stent, uh, but it would probably be a bifurcation stenting technique. Uh, you wouldn't be able to support the patient with uh, with impella, at least traditionally, because of the vascular disease with the fem fem bypass surgery. So, we actually got creative and did a selective uh, a hybrid approach where we had the patient get a minimally invasive limit LAD through a thoracotomy. And then once they recovered from that, we plan to do um, uh, IVUS guided uh, 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 PCI. And I, I don't think you could see these, unfortunately, but uh, basically off pump limit LAD uh, started DAPT on post op day one. There was some AFib post op. Uh, the patient then underwent PCI on post op day three from radial access. With, um, with pre-dilating with balloons. Uh, I was not the operator. I might've used rotational atherectomy, but ultimately the operator uh, muscled through and used shockwave. Uh, and then with shockwave, it was able to get full plaque expansion and then stented with, with a four millimeter uh, um, uh, uh, drug looting stent. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a 3.5 millimeter drug looting stent in the left main extending into the circumflex um, and uh, four millimeters into the left main with, uh, with excellent uh, final outcome with IVUS guidance and was discharged on post-op day six on, um, on clopidogrel and oral anticoagulation therapy for the post-op AFib. And so in conclusion, uh, I think coronary CTA with provisional FFR is a disruptive technology in our system, and I think it should be in most systems. They have better outcomes, better patient experience, less radiation, less false positive, less false negative, uh, and consequently less stress and nuclear tests in favor of CTA and sometimes MRI. It's better utilization of the cath lab with less uh, waste of time, unnecessary diagnostic caths, and a higher proportion of vascularization. And even in the negative caths, or negative CTAs, you can see plaque that should drive more aggressive preventive therapy, which has been proven to lead to, to better outcomes for patients. So CTA, in my opinion, should be the primary ischemia testing in a majority of patients who present with chest pain. And I apologize for those images not running, but you've seen, you've seen what those images look like. So uh, with that, I will end and uh, surrender my screen uh, back, to, uh, back to everybody else. Peter, I uh, want to just give you a chance for the last comments, and then we'll close uh, with any parting shots uh, it's just from been our, such a uh, panel. It's been such a great overview, and and I got to say it's it's wonderful to see Sky supporting this because this this discussion of how a, a non invasive imaging technology can really impact interventional practice and clinical practice in general is such a huge deal. You know, um, when we all start integrating CTA, we all think about the the most obvious things. You know, normal coronaries don't have to go to the cath lab anymore. As a cath lab director, I tell you, we waste time and don't generate dollars off diagnostic heart casts. And so the ability to keep those folks out of the lab is such a huge deal. You know, the ability to increase our sensitivity for, for folks that have disease we haven't found, as was discussed in other cases here, is such a huge deal. You know, we shouldn't see folks that are getting stress tests and being told they're normal and go live their life, and then are coming in a year later, you know, with a massive heart attack or cardiac arrest. It just doesn't have to happen anymore. Um, what these cases have been so great at showing is that 
more and more, the more you integrate the technology, the more you see these other valuable benefits. You see patients who anatomically have complex disease, and so cath labs are scheduling them for different types of cases in advance, more slots, different operators. I've had junior operators come up to me and say, hey, you know, this is a, probably a left main impella rota case. Is, are you around? Or is there someone else kind of around who can kind of help with that procedure? You know, we've integrated coronary CTA into our program, into our cath lab case reviews with our and so it'll be used as an opportunity for, for heart team discussions in advance of ever having had a catheter enter the body. And, and blending that with plaque analysis and characterization, you know, it, it really is just one of the most transformative technologies to touch interventionalist practice, both in the cath lab and, and before patients ever get there, as I think all these talks will demonstrate it. So um, it's been a huge value to us. You know, as, as a Sky Fellows um, Program Director, as Sahil, I know you have been as well, the interest and passion for this tech in the next generation of interventional cardiologists is also huge. And, and I think we're just more and more, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of how much this is going to really transform what we do every day. Thanks, Peter. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your kind attention. We're a few minutes over time, but I certainly think this was a great series of discussions about heart flow and FFRCT and, and the future, as well as the present uh, of this technology in our cath lab workflow. Uh, there is a link in the chat uh, regarding uh, where to go for your CME. Uh, and and please, uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, I wanna thank all of my faculty members uh, from uh, coast to coast, north and south, uh, for your participation, certainly uh, for providing additional color commentary and insight. And uh, we certainly will welcome, uh, you know, email questions to the to the society, which we can distribute to our faculty subsequently. Uh, and as you know, this will be a recorded program that will be uh, living in perpetuity, uh, at least on the Sky Education webpage. So, with that, I want to thank all of you for your uh, kind attention, and thank our faculty and and the folks at HeartFlow for their kind support. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Emerging Technologies webinar series. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.